Five o'clock, I'll open the meeting. Uh, everybody in the room knows about the fire procedure. I don't think there's anybody there. not knowing the fire procedure. Uh, so we'll get that to the level. I've got apologies from Councillor Lloyd, <coughs> Councillor Dolke, Councillor Margrave for the substitute. Is that right? Yes, 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 yes. 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 Uh, which was actually put on uh, the web and that uh, was corrected as you know at the full council uh, the of the when, when I corrected that minute so we've got to get that done. Saying that, can I sign the two of them as, as true or whatever it is? You can sign the corrected version, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm already <coughs> sign the corrected version. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's really nice. Those the June Declarations of interest. Are those no one just to write? Okay. Public consultation, we have none. Uh, yeah. we'll take an item number six at the first on agenda because Councillor Watkins has got to be elsewhere and the uh, portfolio holder is here with comfort in order to. Uh, so you can tell about the report. Press up here. Yeah, well, right, okay. Right, thank you, Chair. Thank you for having me um, This was an interesting piece of work done by a small working group, um, myself, John Ains, and Jill Shepherd, and lots of officers from the council. It was to look at freedom of information and complaints procedure, of which a lot of officers seem to be pleased that we were looking at, to be fair. Um, the recommendations are what's right out in front of you, so, so is the background. And all I'm here to do really is take questions because I know that you've read it thoroughly and you're ready to go with it. After, after you've agreed it here, um, it should go to the cabinet member and then uh, things will be put in place. So any questions, so to you. Any questions on the document in front of us? Council Conducor. I'm just going to say how positive it is to have had a review. Yeah. And one thing we had in the past when we had reports is we had a complaints report for one month. So I do hope if we're having quarterly complaints reports, it's a quarter's report. Because what effectively we did is we only saw one month in three or one month in four when we got the monthly report, which is say how many complaints happened in that month. And when we had things like the issues with the changing over the recycling bin instructions. If that happened in the week that you got the, the month you got the report for, you've got loads of reports in that month. But if it happened between the monthly reports, so I think the quarter report is really good um, step. One thing that always annoys me also is when you get emails, complaints and freedom of information requests, sometimes they say uh, no, no reply um, email address, do not reply to this email address, which is an absolute disaster because then you've got to find an email address for someone then to send you a reply to. So I hope that's going to be sorted out as well. 
Yeah, Please. Keith, that is one of the things that most have always me, and that is being addressed. So all of that is being addressed, and there's going to be personal touches in the letters rather than the blank emails that you get now and now, and blank letters, closing everything off. So everything, all the recommendations are there. And um, really good piece of work off those way. Anything else on can councillors actually access firm step because you, you mentioned it and also the fact that there might be some track yeah you can, you've got everything everything that so there's going to be a rough training here as well as you see mm. so so but both the officers and and councillors are going to be offered training to show you how to log on make your account and then you can track everything but at the minute if you've just got a, a number so it'll be nd yeah. did it did it which I think is absolutely rubbish because then you have to go through loads of reference numbers. So they're now going to be uh, the title, so if you say Abbey Street or whatever, and then there's going to be a sub -side title. Mm. And then if you're not happy, and then you can escalate that, and then it goes to the direct. Do you, would you think, Chris, it would be worth all these recommendations if the committee um, accept the recommendations, which I hope they will, that you know it's pulled together in a protocol? Mm you know, uh, a flow chart sort of thing, so any new person that will know what the protocol is and how to go through these things. New members. Well, yeah. any member. Yeah. Yeah. Member, officer, you know, any member of staff, you know, that these, all these recommendations and other things that have um, been mentioned are actually pulled together into a policy document. Yeah, to a protocol. So, so let's just see what we want. All, the all these recommendations here, and this is off the first working group, so I'm hoping that it's an ongoing thing where we can add to it and tweak it a little bit as it goes on. Yeah, that was the other thing, Chair. So, absolutely. do you think it's worth setting up this working, um, you mentioned, user group that meet maybe every quarter or whatever um, to go through and follow through what has already been started as a good piece of work? I think well, one, yeah, one, um, of the, one of the officers actually who it's mentioned that it would be uh, perhaps we should be able to get together like this as some form of user group to share problems and get assistance from other colleagues. Yeah. You know, that they meet, add that to recommendation that they meet every quarter. Yeah, you can add that. Yeah, I don't want that. I don't know. Anybody else from the panel? Thank you Chair. Um, Again, I think it is a very good piece of work and I, I, I would endorse the recommendations. I was interested at um, recommendation C, where you say a fundamental change is required for the system that will give the operators the ability to relocate items. We all know that updating systems usually has a cost involved. Was the panel given any ideas of that? I'm just no. conscious that the cabinet may yeah. ask. There's no cost, about no cost involved. What, what, um, the officers had already been doing, they were already working on something. But what happens at the minute is if, if something, if a complaint was assigned to you, you can, you can do work on it, but you can't reassign it to then Phil if he's got to do some additional work on it. So that is just going to tweak that system, whereas you can do your bit and send it over to Phil so we can finish it off. So all the works that will be needed, we can do at no cost to the yeah, council. It's just pure work. That's good. A lot of this is ready to go now. It's just the need uh, the okay. So we move the recommendations in front of us, plus the plus, plus the user group. Yeah. yeah. So we get volunteers for a user group. I presume that's a couple of councils as well as officers are aware of looking at something different from user group. I, I think, Chair, it's entirely up to you if you want uh, to have a few members on that user group at the same time, they use it to the system. To be fair, I think the officers could deal with that now. Yeah. As, as long as that was put into place, these recommendations were put into place, the officers could sort that. It, okay. it would just be tweaking it. Does everybody have agreed with that clarification? And we, we accept this as it is with uh, the user group we, we set up. And of course, item number I, and then to this, that uh, six months' time, We'll be yeah. looking after yeah. there. Yeah, they did ask me to come back in six months. And yeah, see and this goes directly to the portfolio holder, yeah. Gwen, who's sitting at the back. Did you get anything to add to, to, no, to no, the no, report? Uh, sure, thank you. 
So everybody in favour of that? I like you. Aye. Okay. So thanks for Thank you very much. Let's go and get the chap in there. But it's not. Right. Item number seven, restoration of the Griff Farm. And this is a wee bit different from what, what we normally do, is that we had a request of full council for this subject to be brought up at, uh, at uh, a panel, and it felt that the, this economic panel was probably the best way to do this. And before, before we actually go into the report, as it says, there's a, I'd like to thank Mr Baxter for taking the time and the trouble to present such a detailed or informative report. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, but then we <coughs> shall, do you wish to say anything on your report, Mr Baxter? Um, I can probably add a little bit to it today, if you'd like me to. Because <coughs> I've sent in a number of emails to most of the councillors, or I think I have anyway, with some extra supportive information. And it may help, if I just briefly summarise it off the top of my head, I'm a little bit unprepared, I wasn't aware I was speaking until I, I turned up today. Because uh, I must have missed an email or something like that. But just to summarise the benefits to the, to the local area of, of pursuing a restoration, Canal and River Trust assign a 7 to 1 payback ratio in health benefits alone to an area for uh, restored sections of canal. And those would mostly be accrued through opening up the, the towpath side of the canal to walkers, cyclists, and funneling them away from main roads. So you're cutting down on accidents, injuries, then obviously the canal itself is flat. There's no hills to go up or down. So it's quite a good recreational route for people to take if they're just getting back into exercise or recuperating from injuries. And that may be quite handy with its proximity to the hospital as well. I, I don't know how we'd account for that. But like I say, there's a 7 to 1 ratio on the health benefits. And if you look at the Canal and River Trust data supplied, there's a 20% uplift in property values around the catchment area of the restored section of the canal, which in one area down Milton Keynes, that was put to about £45 million worth of benefits. And that's on the, uh, that's on the Link Canal, the building between the Grand Union and the Great Ooze, I believe, to Bedford, Milton Keynes to Bedford. And then, of course, there's other opportunities that would come from having this section of canal there. You have the opportunity to set up a, a pocket of industry there, supporting the, uh, the canal side of things. You know, this is just off the top of my head at the moment. It doesn't have to happen this way at all by any means, but there is an opportunity to set up a workyard, perhaps, with dry dock, slipway, things that can support the canal craft and create jobs in the area. So I believe, looking at the figures available from the County Council, there is a shortage of jobs in the area, so we might be able to get some benefits employment-wise. Certainly from a tourism point of view, it, it would tie in very well with uh, the George Eliot thing that's happening in that area. Wasn't they, weren't they proposing to open a small museum or exhibit at the, the Griff House? So, yeah, so, so it could well tie in with that quite nicely. And of course it's a walking route as well, so it would open up a, a George Eliot walk in the area, maybe, which is going. I only found a site recently, it's Greenbelt around there, isn't it? Faultland Farm, Gypsy Lane. I think it's listed as Greenbelt, but it is in the Borough Plan. At the present moment in time. Yeah, I know it's in the Borough Plan for development, which is interesting. I mean, it would make that land a lot more valuable, having the canal there, for one thing. And um, then again, getting back onto the walking thing, we have the, the new railway station at Bermuda, 
or St George's Way. That is actually sitting right next to where the canal arm is, or was. So using the, the canal arm restoration, you would actually punch a new walking route underneath the A Treble 4 to the back end of Bermuda Village into the, um, I don't know what to call that estate there, that Bermuda estate. The, we call it the Flower Pot Estate, maybe. Yeah, yeah, the Flowers Estate. Yeah, yeah that one. It, it would punch a walking route underneath the A Treble 4 to that estate and, and to the broader Stocking Ford and Kingswood area, so people could walk and cycle into that station if, if they wished. And of course, uh, the canal itself, the main Coventry Canal, is already Sustrans routes. 52, okay. So it would link over to the main cycle network as well from that side of the town, which is all very good if you live over that way. And then of course there's this report I generated a while ago, this, this is quite a while ago actually, back when we were looking at the, um, so I submitted this for the first consultation of the borough plan, looking at the aims and objectives of the plan against what was being proposed. And I think it, it came out quite favourable. Uh, seven out of nine visions would be satisfied in the borough plan with this restoration. And of course, as I said in my, my question to the council, at the full council that time, the generally accepted means of, of going about these things is to form a charitable trust. A bit like the Ashby Canal Association and the Ashby Canal Trust and a number of other uh, trusts that exist on the canal network, like the Saltisford Arm Trust, for example, down in Warwick. And then from there you would apply for national lottery funding, which is something there is precedent for. It was announced early in July, early this month, the Montgomery Canal on the borders of Wales and Shropshire has just been awarded £4.5 million to restore approximately one mile of canal with a number of triple SIs along it to bring it back into navigation. So we have good precedent uh, to support the case and looking at what the infrastructure involvement might amount to in the work list, you're probably looking at a similar cost to this sort of restoration, between four and five million pounds, just as an estimate. I'm no expert on, on canal restorations, obviously, but that would seem to tie in to the level of work that we would have to do comparing the Montgomery restoration. And then, of course, in the long term, benefits to the council. Obviously, if you could migrate the Bermuda Lake and Griff Hollows Greenways across to a trust management, then the cost of maintaining those pockets of land would also migrate to the trust, so it would start to save the council money in terms of land maintenance. And then of course with any businesses that could be located on the arm or around the lake, you are looking at business rate income going into, into the pot that the Neaton draws from as well. So financially there are a number of opportunities there and of course you know, the biggest one that has to be mentioned would be mooring fees. I have sent in examples of the fees charged elsewhere locally like Hinkley Marina and a conservative estimate for the fees that could be raised annually from that length of canal with the basin at the end, it, it could be to the order of £300,000 a year income to the trust, which could then be used to help maintain the canal and the surroundings, and then the surplus. Well, I'm not sure what the legal status of any surplus would be, but maybe that could be used within the borough again to help maintain green spaces or to you know, expand on the standards of maintenance of the canal in a broader network in this area to make it more attractive and to work on the tourism income. So, like I say, there's lots of opportunities there, and really it's now down to the council and the councillors to decide if they think it's an appropriate use of that stretch of land, and then to decide whether it's appropriate to enable a trust to be formed in such a way to take this job on. Okay. Any questions from the panel from Mr. Baxter? Yeah. Uh, where's the nearest work? Boat workyard is it Hinkley? 
We've got one down at Boot Wharf still. Yeah. They're, they're yeah, building no, all those houses yeah. by it. They, they're not very well equipped, though. They don't have a craning facility, a dry dock, a slip mm. rate, and the, the cost of crane... I mean, it's £800 to hire a crane for the day. So <coughs> the cost of doing a lot of the work there is, is quite high compared to other yards, such yeah. as the one down at Hill Morton. Hill Morton. I mean, I, I used to dry dock down in Hillmorton for work on my boats, and, and basically I, I just pay for the work done to the boat, the dry dock's free, mm. when, you use, when you use the workers there. Thank you. The idea is brilliant in many ways, but there's a lot of really <coughs> big physical things in the way, particularly the A444. Uh, I'm glad you're here, you've got it as potentially yeah, halfway, but in terms of alignment, would you need a lock or what would you need to cross the A444? Because that seems to be like the multi million pound problem is to get under that. <laughs> it is quite a big obstacle. But looking at the height of the road surface and the height of the canal, it should be a relatively straightforward tunnel under the job. And it's something they are doing in, in other restorations around the country. I mean, the Ashby Canal, the nearest big restoration taking place, there's a dual carriageway over a stretch of canal there, and what they're going to have to do is construct a lock either side to drop the level of the canal under the road so the boats could go underneath and then up again either side. So there, there are quite well established practices for dealing with these things. Anybody else? See, my biggest concern is. is money. This is going to cost an absolute fortune. Millions and millions and millions of pounds. Even if we talk about the A treble four and try to do something with the A treble four, I'm not saying you should have something like the Falkirk wheel, <laughs> which would be ideal for anybody's position if anybody's seen the Falkirk wheel. It's a big tourist attraction. Yes, I know, but who pays the money in the end up in order to get it to be that tourist attraction. So my biggest concern is the money. I can see this being aspirational I see it's a good vision for the future of the borough, but the, f the money's not there. The partnerships are not in place. We're talking about millions and millions and millions of pounds in order to see this vision. Because uh, one of the things that I know, I've, I've walked all the, the canal routes once upon a time, as they say, on Arbury Estates, where the old canal workings are still there. You would have thought that. Um, he was the first MP to actually travel, I believe, by barge from his estate all the way to London. And the, and the workings are still there, etc., etc. So I'm all in favour of trying to do things that are practical. Unfortunately, in this time, in this place, in history, there is no money, we haven't got any money to put forward for this. Unless somebody suggests that we set up some kind of... Um, working party to try and get something through the voluntary sector part, but I can't, you know, I can't see... That, that, that is the basic proposal, we set up you know, a voluntary trust of local people and then apply for external funding from the National Lottery. And I believe there may be EU funding available still, while we're still within the EU, we've not left yet, so that there is the possibility of funding from there too. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, history is something that I'm quite fond of, and we have a rich history in the Eaton Meadows, which I don't think we make it enough of in, in this place. And the Arbury Estate and, and the canal infrastructure is something which we could potentially do more with. So I am quite sympathetic to what Mr. Baxter is proposing because our, our local counterparts in the area they have big things that they play on, particularly Stratford. Uh, Shakespeare and, and, and Coventry and their canal infrastructure and to an extent we do lag behind we don't make as much of our, of our heritage as we should do but I think that we could recommend to cabinet that we support the principle of doing this subject to there being no cost to the council or an office of time and investigate these options I'm happy to look at setting up a working group to start working with officers to see with officer time being the, the only issue, whether going to the Heritage Lottery Fund is uh, viable, whether we can look at other sources of income, so long as there isn't a, co a 
an outlay, a capital outlay to this council. I think we should be aspirational. That's what we're being told in this whole borough plan process. If we want to attract people in, into our, our towns, then we need to be aspirational. We might not be able to do it now in the next two years, the next five years, but we could say as a policy that if the circumstances of the borough change, this is something we want to do and, and be there, be bold and be brave and say, yes, we want to do this, but come and talk to us. Ask these big people to come and talk to us, but I think we need to do some of the groundwork ourselves. And I think a, a working party is a good idea and I'm happy to propose that. And let's go and talk to the officers, see what the expertise is there for um, getting inherited lottery fund applications, what the other examples are around us as to how we go about it. And if we need to set up a trust, I'm sure we can seek the relevant legal advice as well, because I think there would be legal implications in anything that we may seek to do. And I'm sure Phil will be able to point us in the right direction on that if the working group decides to look at that. But I think to, to turn around and give it a blind no is wrong. Mm -hmm. I think we need to investigate. And if the answer is, I'm sorry, we can't do anything at this mm -hmm. stage, then I think Mr Baxter and others of uh, uh, his, his view would then be able to turn around and say, look, you've been fair, you've given us a decent hearing, you've done the work. If it turns out we can't do it, they'll feel that we've done our bit. But I think at this stage we need to do a bit more, push a bit more, dig a bit more, and then come up with some options for cabinet instead of just turning around and giving it an outright no at this stage. If that's a, if that's a panel's feeling, feeling, then there's nods around the room. I told this is not happen very often. I'll second that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's on camera, John. Yeah, you were slow. You should propose it. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, no. I think it's, I think it's right. We, sh we mm. should have we should we should have vision for the for the borough. We should have yeah. aspirational things as well. But it's, at the same time, there's got to be a real reality. And if we can turn around and set, if we can turn around and set up this um, this working party or whatever we wish to call it, extend it to to whatever we can, and then come back at some time in the future to say what can be done and what can't be done. At least it's a step forward rather than a step back. Council Conjugal. Um, I've walked this quite a few times, and from Bearing Way and the railway station, Maruna Park, to the Coventry Canal, mm -hmm. is already a footpath, and under the Coventry Road, there's already a raised bit of footpath and the, the low bit where the canal mm -hmm. used to go or whatever. So, in terms of what is possible, I don't think it's a yes or no, it's a, it's a how far can you go and in terms of getting from the railway station to the Coventry Canal, which would be a very useful cycling route, you can walk it at the moment, it is a, a legal walking route but not a cycling route, it, it almost forms the canal again in heavy rain. Yeah, the, the, the underpass under the Coventry Road, it's a wonderful video actually of it reforming by the Muda Park station where heavy rain off um, St George's Way and the actually refloods the course of the old canal. So I, I don't think we're talking multi millions to get as far as the railway station. So I think a sensible thing would be to look at not just the cost of a super duper twenty million pound project or whatever the whole thing is, but actually also look at can you get the first half mile or third of a mile as a a, a, a useful way from the council depot in fact onto the Coventry Canal and then from the Coventry Canal you can come either way. I think I think that could be part of the working party that they've done. Mm -hmm. They say, well there's a bigger picture. But the, the, the jigsaw is what we keep saying, well part of the jigsaw we do that there and do that there. That the rest of the bits, bits, bits and pieces might actually give us some benefits. What's the panel's opinion? Should we try and set up a Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yes. Yeah. Should we do that? And then, at least it's just, if everybody's in favour of that, let's turn around and do that, get some volunteers in and see if we can do it. If not, if the whole vision's there, let's see if we can get some sort of bit of bits and pieces done in order to do, you know, to what everybody would been saying earlier on. So, is the panel in favour of that? Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So, we'll, so, we'll do that and. Uh, Thanks to Mr Baxter once again for all your time and your um, input. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, item number eight. Volunteer.
check the performance. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, okay. In terms of the report that you've got in front of you, what I don't want to do is go through the kind of minutiae on the report. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to look at it, but in, in essence the report covers performance for quarters three and four for our four contracts in the third sector which are delivered for our three organisations. So Warwick Chicago delivers two contracts. One is for infrastructure support, which is the kind of nuts and bolts and supporting community run organisations um, to function, to develop, to develop, to draw down funding, um, to have the right governance set up in and amongst an array of other things. Um, a newly acquired contract which Alison is here from Carver as a locality manager that we shall talk to you about is the volunteer development contract which was previously um, delivered by the volunteer um, bureau, um, the volunteer centre. Uh, now it's delivered by Carver county wide, so Alison will talk a little bit more, a bit more about that. Then we have Warwickshire Employment Rights Service which is, as it says, talk, uh, focused on employment rights support to people that have had issues with their employers and then the CAB. So what I'd like to do, um, because in the report what you've got is the performance for the two workshop well, contracts first. I'm going to kind of admit that initially and then Alison's going to talk to you about the items that you wanted discussing the last time, which was principally the transition from the new town centre. So Carver has moved after being at 72 High Street for almost 30 years almost 30 years, they're now anchored um, at the Newtown Centre, um, and Alison will explain how that transition is going and, and the things that they're doing, um, and also around, around the voluntary development contract and how they took that on board and what they're doing within the locality and potentially further field. So just to pick up the performance for the Citizens Advice Bureau for quarters three and four, as you'll see from the report, just kind of picking up some of the key highlights, uh, the client contact for this period was just slightly below target. Um, however, in quarters one and two, it was significantly above target. The ward that accounted for the highest number of clients for both quarters three and four um, was Abbey Ward. And the key challenges, um, talking to the CAB, that will be very, very interesting, and they will be here at the next scrutiny panel um, to kind of take questions and discuss some of these matters. Will be the universal credit yeah, yeah. in October, yeah. um, and that is going to have significant implications for the cohort that accesses an array of serv support services, not just the CAB, but CAB is one of those. Some of those people access and need support from an array of community voluntary organisations which in turn will affect the numbers of people and the types of queries that Carver will get and also um, the kind of queries that Royal Shipping Human Rights will get. So David and Michael Lisa will be here at the next meeting because that will be, I think, something that is very pertinent and very important to get a kind of handle on. Um, but overall, CAB is still got um, its office in Aneaton and you've got the office in, in Bedworth. One of the interesting points that you see that you get in quarter four is our funding in terms of what that helps in terms of additional money that is brought in from other funders um, accounts £431,000 so that's a figure that you get normally in the kind of quarter four um, and that you can see the breakdown um, there in appendix B of different organisations so you've got the core grant made up of what Warwickshire County Council provide, what we provide together with a host of other organisations. Um, and again, the kind of challenges are not too dissimilar, the breakdown is not too dissimilar, um, but that's based on our kind of demogra demographic profile, the national trends. Um, so it's, it's kind of it's tough going, the environment for external funding is getting increasingly tough. Um, so like, like us as an authority, they're having to focus on priority areas and finding more flexible, innovative ways of providing that service for less. Um, then Watch Employment Rights Service, which is co-located with um, CAP within the Neaton office. Again, the, with them, the client contact has been exceeded. Um, you've got case studies attached for all the organisations. The two areas, like the previous quarter, that have the kind of highest area of demand 
are unlawful deductions and unfair dismissals. That is typified by, um, to some extent, the kind of areas of employment that a lot of people are employed within that access that particular service. Uh, and it's one that employment rights service is actually absolutely pivotal. So they support people, not to maybe bring in a huge amount of kind of compensation because of how an agency or their employer um, has maybe wronged them. But without that, ordinarily, you know, they're not going to be able to afford to get other legal advice. So the free support that they get through the Employment Rights Service is absolutely vital. The areas of, in terms of clients and their origination from the ward is Campbell. So for quarters three and four, the vast majority or the highest number of clients came from the Campbell ward. One of the things that Lisa is doing in particular is trying to find more flexible ways of clients being able to access that service. So face-to-face -face is very, very important for a particular section of the community. But now they're trying to develop their website, their online portal, um, and also kind of using social media. So they're able to now support people totally online. That is something new that they've started. And again, when Mike or Lisa are here in the next scrutiny panel, that is something um, that they're going to be touching upon because that should be much further forward than where they are now. But overall, with those two organisations, again, there's no major areas of concern. Um, and again, the environment is, is quite challenging, but it's not changing a huge amount. National trends obviously affect them in some respect. Locally, um, you know, when big employers, so that they end up working with the likes of people affected by changes at the co-op, and they're working with other current employers that are going through some difficulties. Um, but a lot of that is kind of confidential, but they can talk about that in a more general sense. So that's kind of very quickly the kind of performance for quarters three and four for those two organisations. What I'd like to do now is pass over to Alison to talk about the transition, the volunteer development contract, then happy to take any questions myself or Alison about the report in its entirety. Is that the panel's wishes rather than just going this? I've we've been saying and then going to Alice and uh, we'll deal with that as collectively. All right, Alison. Okay, I'm not bad. Um, so we've had the um, responsibility for the volunteer development contract for not quite a year. Yeah, is it? Or has it been a year? Um, anyway, um, so we have a part-time volunteer and coordinator. We have. Um, volunteer and coordinator in, in each of the five districts of the county now, so that, that's a new change um, that Warwickshire Carver has got. Um, previously volunteering was, was delivered by a number of different organisations, so we've brought it all in-house. So we've got a part-time development worker um, who has really hit the ground running. Um, in the same period we've also uh, county-wide developed a new, or, or brought in a new system called Volunteer Connect, and that is a new brokerage tool that individuals seeking volunteering opportunities can register their interest and their skills, and um, volunteer involved in organisations can register their opportunities on there. So it's a little bit like um, Match.com or Tinder, but without the swiping. It's a little bit of a matchmaking service. So we, what we want to do is, is foster um, opportunities for groups to manage their own opportunities, rather than the need to keep approaching third party organisation like ourselves to do the legwork for them. We're trying to empower the groups to, to, to find, to develop their own opportunities and to find their own volunteers. Um, now that's, that's the theory behind an online system but it is absolutely not the only tool that we use. Um, we know in the Neaton and Bedworth that um, internet usage and access to, 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 to equipment is often a problem for people for lots of different reasons so I would probably say that a good 70% of our volunteering workload is still done face to face with residents so we are not relying on, on an online tool at all um, for people to do that um, so yes that, that's fairly time intensive um, but we get lots we get better results certainly with individuals looking for opportunities um, they get a, a more personal approach and they get um, some time to talk to somebody to talk about their skills and what they can offer and make them think a little bit more broadly 
Um, I would still say the vast majority of individuals coming forward are um, probably seeking work, so they're looking for volunteers to, to develop their CVs, um, gain confidence, get them back into the workplace if they may have been out for, for a while. Um, our coordination is doing a lot of work with our talent match project. So talent match is a, um, a Coventry, Nuneaton and Beckham North Warwickshire lottery funded large programme that works with 19 to 25 year olds not in employment and education. Um, so those firms are from converts away from the job market. So um, our coordinator is doing a lot of work with their client group. So she's seen lots more young people um, than I think uh, maybe in previous um, years. So we're really trying to actively encourage organisations to look at their volunteering opportunities and how they might be more appealing for a younger age group um, and the challenges that, that that younger age group often bring with them with quite complex lives. Um, so that's been a really nice change I think that, that we've been able to add um, now having this volunteer development contract on your behalf. Um, has anybody got any particular questions about volunteering? Thank you. Open up to the panel. Come to it. Thanks, Chair. Um, it's, it's not a question as such, more an observation. Um, just for a bit of background, I, I work in a college, I'm head of year 13, and at the start of every year, um, so one of the big things that I make a real drive on is for all of my students to take part in some sort of volunteering activity. Um, and I notice in the summary of events that there was a volunteer presentation to Home Lane Sixth Form, when there was approximately 100. Um, attendees. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if perhaps you, you're missing a bit of an opportunity to sort of tap into the students that we have in the borough. Um, Eggs has well over a thousand students um, in its sixth form. There's other sixth forms in the East and Bed. I just wonder whether that is something that we need to explore a little bit more. Absolutely. Um, she's, she's been and spoken to um, a few of the sixth forms, if, if not all of them. I can't, off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, the, the difficulty is often finding the right opportunities. I absolutely agree that we've got a real untapped un un potential there. But it is, it's about finding the opportunities for people. And so we need to do a lot of work with our organisations to make sure that they're of the mindset that their opportunities aren't well. Mildred always comes in, you know, and you know, three hours every week and she's been coming for the past 30 years. I fully recognise that that's not what a lot of young people will be signing up for, they want you know, maybe an hour a week, an hour a month, or they want to volunteer a week of their time and, and mm. that would be great. So we need to change the mindset of the sector to, to maybe offer and think about their opportunities slightly differently. Um, and that's not saying that, that there aren't opportunities out there already, and we have had some really good transitions of, of some from some students, but again it's about the length and time of opportunity and the support that our organisations can offer and their flexibility that they can offer the young people. Um, so it will be a work in progress. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Anybody else? Come on, Chair. I just wanted to ask Abu um, a question on the, the wider report. Um, when we're looking at Appendix B, it mentions the different categories of support for CAV on page 52. And it gives a, a fairly detailed breakdown of the, of the categories of support, but I wonder if you could, either now or, or for the next meeting when the CAB come along, give us more of an indication as to what signposting is for? Um, because is it signposting to the other categories or is it signposting to other sources of support, other organisations, that sort of thing? It might be interesting to see what that signposting involves if the CAB can't help where they're sending people to. Uh, completely, and I think that probably, from my understanding, it'd probably be a mixture of the two, but if we can get some more detail. Not the next one. Because it's a, yeah. it's a big area, 77, it's a, it's a big lot, so it might be interesting just to see what that is. Okay. I'll make sure David, at the next one, maybe try to get some information beforehand, yeah. but if not, at the next meeting. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Call for call. We had the million pounds awarded for the Hilltop Cadwell area, and obviously it's very hard to get the volunteers and get that spent, and it was a very long term big project. Has that moved forward, stalled? Where are we with that? Right. 
So, um, I'll take a breath on this one. Um, so, our role in the, um, the HTT, the Hilltop and Cadwell Big, Big Local Area, is we are the locally trusted organisation. So, that means we are basically the banker on behalf of that community partnership. And we are also the, the legal body that can contract um, with other organisations and service providers on their behalf. So the, the HTC is a partnership of now, I think we've got 12 members again now, because it's been some new recruits, and they're all residents of the, of the HTC area. And the boundaries of HTC is um, all of Old Hill, Hilltop, New Hilltop, Cadwell, so down to Wenbrook, right over Country Road, including all of Old Hilltop, down to Hanover Leap and um, Cote Narches, and um, up to, to basically where the houses end at Coventry Road and Gorsey Knob. So it's, um, <coughs> it's about 2,000 or so residents, I think, in that area. Uh, we are now in coming to the end of year two of a 10 year programme. So there are 150 of these local, uh, big local areas across England. Um, HTC is, is one of those, and they have around a million to spend over around 10 years and the reason that's quite woolly is because all the 150 million was invested centrally so there will be some um, investment returns on that so they're going to make an announcement in September about any um, in additional investment so it could be more than a million and it could be over 10 years because depending on what the partnerships want to do with their money they might decide to some areas have decided to um, invest in um, buy to let properties so they will get returns on those investments way beyond the end of the 10 year period that is not what our HTC residents have decided to do so they have just come to the end of their first two year period and they had a plan um, they've uh, used about £100,000 so far. A lot of that has been um, on staff costs to get them to where they want to be, doing co bits of consultation, there's been some um, small grants that have been made, uh, there's been support around, um, around social eating and uh, youth sessions, so there's been about £100,000 in their first two year period. At their partnership meeting on Tuesday night, they have agreed a, a new two-year plan, which w once um, sanctioned by Local Trust, who, who's the national managing body, will probably be for around about four hundred thousand to use over the next over the next two years. Um, a large chunk of that is because the researchers said we want things for our young people to do. We haven't got enough play facilities, or the play facilities that we have got aren't adequate. So we've put a large proportion of money to, for the second year to do lots of investigation about the parks that are um, there and how we can work with borough parks and outdoors teams to, to look at what, um, what can be um, done together. So it's quiet. Engagement has been a problem with with residents, but that's not a surprise. That's why big local areas have been chosen because you know engagement is low and they haven't had significant external um, funding investment in the area previously. So it was always going to be a challenge, um, and continues to be. Anybody else? Is the project finished nationally? Can we apply for that? <laughs> it's closed. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just to mention that when we were asked, we were asked for three, three yeah, areas. Um, so I can get the values and we can follow the three data sets. <coughs> Abbey was one of the areas, yeah. together with an area in Bedworth, and the area that they came down, they came down unannounced. They walked around all three areas, and the areas that, or the area that they said <coughs> they needed in Bedworth was was HTC. And the way that they work is, they worked. We had to submit the application, but the money could only be taken on providing that you had an infrastructure body, so up and down the country. Um, you know, that's, that's how they kind of wanted to liaise initially. So. Anybody else? Uh, the report is here for, is for noting, uh, so thanks, thanks for 
coming today and we we'll get the second half next time around. Yes. Okay? Okay, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Right, item number nine, the growth hub. Just all in Gareth Edwards. Thanks, Chair. Uh, we'll just wait for the um, presentation to pop up. Oh, <laughs> I think that means you're going to lose. You've got your cycle backs. You've got your cycle backs. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, put it, I'll put it in the, in the next one. Thanks, Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Chris Laws, the Economic Development Officer, and next door to me is Gareth Edwards, the Country uh, Warrior Select Account Manager for the Needs and Development. Gareth introduced himself properly. What we're here today to talk to you about is um, the activities of the Growth Club over the past year. Uh, what we're asking you to consider are the engagements that the business assists within the update. We're asking for you to note the planned engagements and the planned activities for the next year and to infer any comments through the Cabinet on the 6th of September. In the report, we have said that there is a um, report of activities, which is Appendix A. Appendix A is actually the presentation, so apologies for that being in the report. This is the presentation that we're going to be using to detail that, but Gareth will go into more details um, just now. So I'll hand over to Gareth, and Thank hopefully you. that works. Yes, I hope so. I'll stand up if you don't mind. Thank you very much, everybody, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Gareth Edwards, as Chris uh, said. And I'm part of the. Um, I think it's right, right now. It's down. It's sort of down. Uh, I'm part of the uh, Coventry Warranty Growth Hub, based uh, over in Coventry. Um, I'll let you just read that in in 15 seconds. Basically, I've done 25 years in the private sector, uh, and then joined the Growth Hub um, almost three months ago. I came into uh, into the public sector. So in terms of uh, what the Growth Hub does, um, what I'd like to just walk through in, in terms of this presentation is twofold, is to talk through what's gone on in the last 12 months, but what the strategy is to deliver um, the economic growth within the meeting Bedworth over the next 12 months. Uh, and please feel free to ask any questions as I, as I go along. Um, I made an assumption maybe wrongly that everyone knows what the Growth Hub does. Um, is that a fair assumption? I won't go into, into who we are then, but basically what, what we're there to do is to demystify the business support landscape as I say in the middle, remove the smoke and mirrors so businesses that need help so they know where to go to. So there's a one-stop shop where people come to and then we can push them into different directions because it is a scary world out there for businesses when they're, when they're grown. In terms of what services are out there, uh, again, you'll probably be familiar but they're uh, along the lines of access to finance, um, innovation, added value and business support. So areas that people need, whether they need new, um, new property, if they're extending their business, then new, new skill sets, we're there to try and help and push people in the right directions. And they're the programmes and partners that we work alongside, um, <coughs> some, some universities in there, the MTC, and we work alongside with lots of those in, in uh, helping businesses across all sectors uh, grow. And I guess the interesting slide uh, for you around this table is how we do it. So, so far, um, and this is, uh, this data is, is from April 16 to March 17. Um, so 76 businesses engaged throughout the 12 month period, which is around 30% up on last year, um, which, is, uh, which is good progress. Um, 15 businesses assisted with their growth plans, which is pretty much in line with the previous year. Um, grants awarded um, under 65,000, which is a significant uh, increase on the year before. Um, in terms of what that does in terms of jobs, it's expected to create 38 jobs across Nuneaton and Bedworth, which is in line with the actual jobs created from the previous year, although the expected job number was higher last year. Uh, and the impact of GBA is around 1.43 million. Um, with Can you just explain for those that might be watching what GBA is? Uh, 
Pardon me. <laughs> Jordan, tell us yeah. uh, GBA is gross value added. So yeah. when something is uh, created, for example, a job, the gross value added is the extra benefits from that job being created. So for example, um, then you have a machinery job. It's everything that then through the uh, the the supply chain things like that that are added. The supplier effect. Is exactly. Yeah. Gross value added. It's normally a very good indicator of the, the economy, so it's, it's seen quite a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and in terms of the private sector investment, that's around £300,000, which I think is, is probably down slightly on the previous year. Okay, on, on, to, uh, on to looking forward. That's looking back and, and, and what we've done. Looking forward is Myself and Chris have been working very closely uh, from a Nuneaton Bedersborough Council and growth up perspective to look at how do we deliver growth going forward? What strategies need to be in place? Um, I, th I think you'll agree all strategies need to come back to a vision and mission statement. So we've gone through with what the Nuneaton and Bedworth mission statement is and vision is and everything that, we're, that I'll talk you through in the next five minutes will lead back into that mission statement and vision. That's from the economic development strategy and he said that and, in, and the, the one at the bottom is a, is a key point, is that Think Local First, which is a big initiative that, that Chris's team are working on to, to use local businesses and move away from the, the national businesses. So keep money in the borough. So in terms of uh, the why uh, and what are we doing, um, very simple graph, impact of growth up across the bottom and the growth of focus at the left. I know it's very, very difficult to see that the, the bottom uh, balloon is 0 to 10 and that's businesses with 0 to 10 employees and that's where we're intending to look at those businesses by exception. By no means are we going to leave those people alone but that will be from a one to many perspective rather than a one to one perspective. So for example we've already set up six workshops in the uh, business centres across the Newton Bedworth between now and Christmas to go through business planning, to go through uh, marketing and to go through cash flow management with those businesses from zero to ten. So by no means are they being left alone. The top right is where we're looking to grow and they're businesses that are between zero and ten employees. Ten to so, sorry? Ten to fifty. Sorry, ten to fifty. Uh, and they're the businesses that bring in economical growth. So they're the ones that will create more jobs and hopefully create more, they'll need bigger buildings, therefore the, the, the rates will increase as well. We shouldn't forget the businesses that are 50 to 250 and they're the ones we're looking to develop relationships with um, and there's, there are lots of those within the, within the boroughs. Uh, we're looking to develop a good relationship with them because they're the ones that really uh, can help increase skill sets and increase jobs. I'm not convinced that relationship's good enough so that's a real piece of work for me going forward. And then the, the bottom, sorry, the, the, on the left hand side is, is where, we, where we tend to be very selective and that's with the businesses with 250 plus employees. For example, Bros in Bedworth, uh, UTI, Unipart, Dairy Crest. Um, you, you'll have seen in the, in the press recently Dairy Crest are looking at making redundancies. Because there's no relationship there, we were on the back foot when that happened. Going forward, if we have those relationships, we can see what we can do to help them uh, and, and put those people that are at risk in touch with other people because it's the people that matter. In terms of uh, how we're going to do it strategically, I'm not going to read you through all the points, but the key point, points are that we'll have a target client pipeline um, which we'll, we'll research before we get in touch with them. So we've got a pipeline of around uh, 80 businesses within the Newton Bedworth. We're cutting them into chunks, 10 at a time. We'll research them and get in touch with them to see where we can help. Um, not everybody wants help, which is something I'm finding out very quickly in the last three months. Um, there's some very pr proud people out there and they don't want help straight away. I understand that. So it's a case of getting hearts and minds uh, tapped in. Um, and the, the bottom of one is a really important one to me is an accurate m measurement of progress. Are we winning or are we losing? And if we start to lose, why are we losing? And then from a tactical perspective, um, how do we get in touch with these businesses? Old fashioned door knocking. I'm an old school type of person. Uh, we go around the industrial sites, we knock a few doors. 
and we ask a few people what sort of help they're looking for. Um, I've done I've done some already. Some's been more successful than others. I went one Friday morning to a company uh, in Bedworth. I thought I bought the breakfast order, which was an interesting uh, discussion when I knocked on the door to have to talk to their MD. Um, but it's important that we, that we have a we have a strategy. Uh, the bottom one you'll see is celebrate successes. I think we need to shout loud and proud when we uh, when businesses grow and when they uh, when they succeed. For example, there's one in. Uh, uh, many of the roof trusses that have moved building, created more jobs, uh, and, and it's a real success story. And, and Chris and his team have, have got that on the re relevant news stories, radio, and on the websites. And I think we need to shout loud and proud of how good we're doing. But it's equally important to me is to discuss our failures, what we're not doing very well, because if we don't change it, nobody will. Every strategy needs uh, you need to understand your strengths and weaknesses, and what your opportunities are and your threats. The good old SWOT analysis. Uh, I'm not going to read them all out. From a strength perspective, there's funding programs that people can draw on if they meet the right criteria. Don't always meet the right criteria, but if we don't try and recommend them, they'll, they'll never know. From a weakness perspective, I think we're all clear that we've got some challenges around space um, and where do people go to grow. Uh, from a threat perspective, business can relocate if we can't help them, which is what I'm here to try and stop happening. And from an opportunity perspective, I really think the time is now. Because the, the, the landscape of the, of the marketplace is changing, and it's changing quickly, and if we don't move with it, we'll lose out. And then the very last slide, um, it seems very simple, but it's very difficult sometimes. It's, it's all of us. So it's Chris's team, it's my team, uh, we're in the growth club, it's working with Alan, it's working with, with Dennis, it's working with you guys around the table to, to get the exposure out there of what the growth club can bring but also to tap into other businesses that you might know that I've not had a chance to talk to yet, that there is a help line there. Can't help everybody, but if we don't ask the question, we'll never know. Thank you very much. Any questions? <coughs> not questions, but a comment. You mentioned Rosa. Yeah. They're a brilliant firm when you want to get anybody in to do uh, not training but what is it the job experience yeah work experience work experience yeah but uh, I, when i arranged for a foreigner somebody from the european union to go yeah no problem whatsoever but not many of our uh, locals uh, Take them up on the offer. That's what I got. Well, some of our people don't want to go and do the work experience there. No, they, they, they don't even bother about because they're a German firm. They don't bother. Yeah, it, it's certainly something that we need to look at uh, because they, I think they employ circa 900 people uh, within within Bedworth. Now, I'm sure I'm sure some of those come from the wider regions, but it's a big number. Uh, and we're looking to uh, to get in and work with them. But when, when I talk about where we're going to focus our attentions, that's one of the bigger companies that we do need to get better relationships with to, to, to deal with those sort of issues as you, as you articulate there. It's a good point. Come on, come on, come on. Um, I've been on this committee three years, and this is the third presentation we've had from the Growth Hub. Okay. Each time we have a different person comes and gives a presentation. Yeah. Um, and each time it feels like we are bottom of the pile with the growth firm. And last year we had a presentation which had, I asked for a chart of the performance of all the five districts in Warwickshire. Yeah. Um, and it was remarkable that Stratford upon Avon had 20 times the inward investment than the Neaton and Bedworth. Yeah, they've got massive car companies putting in all the stuff around Gaydon and yeah. There is yeah. so much stuff going on in the south of the county. There was a 20 to 1 difference. And, and this year's figures are actually worse. You know, we're actually going downhill in the Neaton and Bedworth. It always sounds very nice when we create 38 jobs, but obviously yeah. we haven't done everything to create those jobs. There's, there's, we've helped those jobs. Absolutely. So yeah. lots of other people. Yeah. Yeah. When you look at the figures, yeah, there are hundreds of jobs being created in the other boroughs with help from the Growth Hub. So we really need the most help, and we're not, we don't seem to be getting it. And in terms of the multipliers, 
the multipliers in other parts of the county are incredible. We have, in the last two years, we haven't had a lot of this year's figures, £3.8 million pounds gone into North Warwickshire in terms of private sector investment. Yeah, the, the money going into some of these things along the A5, yeah, the, yeah. the virtual copies, is absolutely wonderful. And there's lots of jobs being created. We've created 38 jobs here. And yeah, the numbers are just so tiny. I mean, how do we get the same growth as everywhere else? And how do we get the growth hub to actually have that consistent presence here rather than, yeah, say, you're, you're the third person doing this job. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're going to be someone different next year again. That's He's only been in the job for three months. Yeah. And we really do seem to be at the bottom of the pile. The, the growth hub seems to be focusing on the place that's easy to grow. It's easy to create wealth and jobs in Stratford. Yeah. It's easy to create jobs. And it is, you've actually got an incredibly hard job here because you haven't got the land and you haven't got the yeah. universities. and Everything's going against us. And yeah, it'd be great if, in some ways it'd be dreadful, but in some ways it'd be great if you had the presentation like I had a few years ago with all the five districts yeah. and how much jobs, help, grants has been created in each one so we can actually compare. Okay. Um, I'll answer the last things first in terms of the focus on Nuneaton. I think Craig Humphrey is the MD of the Growth Hub, has acknowledged uh, probably the last six months that Nuneaton hasn't had the continuity that it needs. Therefore, that I've been brought in dedicated to Nuneaton and Bedworth. Um, I spend a lot more time here, uh, as Phil was uh, back me up on, than I do in Coventry and uh, in my own desk because I'm trying to really work very hard with the guys here. Um, so I think in terms of growth and focus, you're getting it. Um, and I will make sure you get it. I'm a proud person, I want to make it happen. I think, secondly, um, in terms of comparing numbers, I wouldn't be com comfortable in doing that, if I'm honest, because I don't think you're comparing apples with apples. I think the, the I, I get where you're coming from, but the landscape in Stratford is totally different to the landscape in Beneath. In terms of the focus of where we're going, we are demand-led, so there is lots of, because Stratford has lots of growth in it, naturally there's more jobs and more economic wealth coming out of it. My job is to work with what we've got in Dunedin and to use a strategy that I've just presented and get into some of those businesses and help them grow and push them through those barriers. Um, I've, I've been to two businesses uh, as part of my um, uh, induction in Stratford and their willingness to grow seems to be a lot more or a lot easier than, the, than some of the business I've met in Dunedin. Now, for me, that makes my job a bit more difficult, but it also makes it more of a challenge. Yes, Paul, we have a question. Yeah, very nice uh, presentation. This area actually interests me because uh, from my background uh, of about 20 years in business supporting Birmingham now. Um, just a snapshot, you, there's that term, job creation of 38, right? Yeah. Now, does it include job saved or is it just purely Job creation. Uh, that's purely jobs created. Creation. So maybe again uh, to help your course, really, sometimes it might be well, sometimes people want to see the job saved. Yeah. Now, moving across to the leverage, right, from a uh, private sector, that's when they are being Again, would it be possible actually to actually also in your maybe future about the amount that um, the individuals, the businesses have actually put in themselves before they are able to? Remember that's number 15. And like, the reason why I'm asking this, sometimes when you measure businesses, especially small businesses too, um, when they are able to, if they have their own contribution and they are able to pursue, capture more from the private, yeah. you can also see the synergy and the way actually the business prosper. But the less, sometimes they put in themselves. You know, especially when you are dealing with uh, you know, small SMEs, the small yeah. minorities. So maybe it would be nice to actually see, maybe in future, uh, the, the balance of the business owner's contribution and how much they've been able to deliver. You know. Okay, I, th I, think that was, uh, I think I did go through those numbers, but I could get you the table. Yes. But for example, when a, when a business applies for uh, for funding, uh, they have to they have to uh, commit to so much money as well. Yes. So, for example, if they draw down forty thousand for capital expenditure, they will probably have to come up with one hundred twenty thousand. Mm -hmm. So that private sector 
uh, number is what they're contributing as well. But I can I can absolutely get you that, no problem. Also, um, on these two, are you also, I mean, are you also helping with working capital or just capi uh, working capital or just uh, purely, you know, capital uh, food? Oh, uh, it, it's working capital and it's capital expenditure. So, it, so if you need machines, mm. uh, and it's also working capital to to help with training, etc., etc. Yes. All right. So, I'll, uh, yeah. any other questions? How much is in the growth fund at the moment? How much is available for companies across what would you come to? Um, I'd be guessing if I told you to be honest, because it's a moving feast. Yeah. Um, the, the, and there's so many different fundings, but I can give you an idea. I'll, I'll happily come back and give you an idea of what's in each pot. Um, yeah. Sorry, we, we, are you talking about specific funds for the Warwickshire Growth Fund? Are you yeah. talking about the? Um, I believe. So I actually sit on the grants panel as well. So mm. I believe there's a couple of hundred thousand pounds, and we've got one on Tuesday. I think so. It's, I know that they're going through a few things at the moment to see what's available for next year. And what's the average size of companies within the needs and bed if you talked about the north to ten and still yeah. tens to thirty or thirty to fifties, what's the sort of spread and where were you although you plan to talk to all of them. Yeah. Right. Um, percentage wise, where are we? Are we a very small small company based? Well, yeah, the, the majority of businesses in the borough, um, for example, I've got the data in front of me, um, so eighty eight percent are micro, so not nine employees. Uh, small is 10%, uh, medium is 1.6%, and large is 0.4%. Sorry, I'm not talking too quick for a few minutes. <laughs> so the majority are micro businesses, but it's, as Gareth said, the ones that are really looking to grow are the ones with the most potential, which are micro. Also, by helping out the micro ones, they're the ones that are more likely to die within the first couple yeah. of years. Mm -hmm. So ensuring that they survive and then flourish they're the ones that we're looking to um, get in there. What's a little really interesting fact is of those, uh, there's, a, there's more of zero to 10, uh, but in the first year, one in three fail. Yeah. Um, and only 2% get to a million pound turnover within three years. Mm. So if you look at the, uh, the 10 to 50 ones, the ones that turn over a million pound, there's only 2% of the ones that are starting up in three years getting there. Mm. And that's, that's, got to, that's got to change. Um, you mentioned you also work in Coventry, so... I'm based in Coventry. You're based in Coventry. Yeah. Isn't it the only place you're responsible for is you've got a bigger area? And in terms of the growth hub, how many staff have they got in each of the sort of districts? Or uh, Really good question. There's uh, six uh, account managers, and the approach we're taking is sort of matrix management. So if you imagine a triangle, and that's not in Bedworth, I'm fully responsible for everything that goes on in the Bedworth. But there might be some subject matter experts that work alongside me, uh, whether it might be in marketing or in digital marketing or in um, manufacturing, that if we work with a certain uh, client that I, I think that somebody can do a better job than me, then I'll bring them in. And vice versa, we'll do that across the other ones. But we're all, we're all assigned to a local authority. Can I ask a couple of questions, perhaps? It's there's recently, we hear there's been a, at um, Nadine Golf Club, there was a business forum. Yeah. Which the, the now mayor of the combined authority attended and spoke. Yeah. Apparently spoke very highly on behalf of Nadine and Bedworth. As where you are situated within the sub region, is there any way we can sort of get more influence or get more things in this direction through the new setup, through, through this? the new central authority, combined authority. I mean. if, I, if I answer that, and then maybe yeah, you can yeah. it. Um, the whole reason we got Andy Street was through being a non-constituent and working yeah, yeah. very closely to ensure that Andy knows what the needs and what brings. So we were, at, at officer level that is, as well as the political level, we were ensuring that um, you know we wanted him to come to here first. And I think it, it, this was his first engagement to a non-constituent member yeah. since he was elected. Um, and through the calibre of speakers we had at that event, so we had Andy, we had Terry Spool from Hariba Myra, we had Holland and Barrett attended and did a very good speech about why they've decided to expand in the needs and rather than going outside. We had Gareth and myself talking about first the growth of and second about being local first. So by ensuring that we have these calibre of speakers who are willing to come to these sort of events, I mean this is the first event we'd put on, I believe as council, for at least three or four years. 
and the feedback we've had has been excellent. The people that have come back and said, at first I didn't realise how positive people were about the borough, and secondly I didn't realise that Andy even knew where we were. And to have that at that sort of feedback level from the businesses that have attended, and also you know, from the growth hub, oh, didn't realise that these guys are here to help your business. And it was through um, these sorts of events that we're trying to get more influence to the borough. Mm. So in that case, it was very successful, and the fact that uh, the mayor of the new combined authority knows where, who we are, and where we are. Absolutely. Mm. And took the time to actually come and yeah. come and see what's been done. So and, and so that's quite good. out of the businesses that that attended, I, I've seen probably twelve of them already, because mm -hmm. um, I want to keep the momentum going. So in terms of the engagements that I talked about earlier, the 76th of last year, I've done 30 already in, in the last uh, six or seven weeks. That's good. Yeah. Anybody else come to come to um, Obviously, it's very, very good pointing out was to put a good impression. But we've also got a lot of problems. So I hope yeah. to one side we've talked to the new combined authority mayor to actually say what issues we've got and yeah, the, the improvements we need, particularly in public transport and things like that. But also. If all these people are here, have we tried to sell them any space in the building next door? <laughs> I think I think that was part of the the overall, you know, the event was to get people to notice about the needs of the borough from the borough itself. Mm. So by bringing people into the borough, by, by putting on these events, this isn't this isn't the only event that we're looking to put on through our feedback. I mean, we we ended up bringing every single business that went to the event and saying, what feedback do you have? What can you suggest that we do? We're looking at putting on further events. That's going to be going on um, within the world. In fact, if you want to speak about the business festival yeah. next, that might be a good idea. So it's, it's it's creating momentum and continuing the momentum. But I think it's a good point about. Yeah, we've got empty buildings, so we should be plugging those. But it, yeah, but it's yeah. the investment opportunities that people, once they know what we've got, yeah. then yeah. get into it. And, and put part of the role that, that I've done with the growth of is to look at the some Chinese delegations that have, that have been over. Uh, and I, I brought two of them around, I showed them around just at the top of the meeting around the Buddha Park. But the, the, what I'm trying to do is to, when, when uh, to answer back to your point of what am I doing in terms of my role, is I'm still very much part of the Coventry setup because I want to be hearing what things are going on and what things we can benefit. So, if, for example, uh, I'm at a Chinese company that want uh, an e commerce uh, warehouse uh, and fully automated. That would be fantastic for the, the shed space that's up in on Bermuda, and that would create loads of jobs. That's the sort of thing I want to try and bring to this particular party. Um, the, the business festival is something that uh, has been sponsored by the Country Monty Let, and that runs from uh, 20th of November to the 1st of December. What that's primarily for is, is, is threefold. It's to put Country Monty on a pedestal, and why it's a good place to invest in and work within which is fantastic for Nottingham Bedworth because we're part of that. It's secondly for the individual businesses to shout about themselves and to put on workshops and festivals. Um, but thirdly, it's to, it's to bring in inward investment. So it's to say to other businesses that are out there, come and have a look at Nottingham Bedworth. Come and see what we've got. Because there are some big businesses here. I mean, XPO are here. I mean, my background is logistics. But XPO are, are a global player, as are UTI, as are RS Components. There are some big people in, and they're here because um, it's very close to the, the the best road network in the UK. It's close to every motorway. You can be south, north, in two hours. Yeah. We could, but we need to bring these people in. That's what the business festival will do. And I'm working with Alan and, and, and Chris and, and the team. I'm looking at what festivals we can put on during that two weeks to really whack home to people why the need Bedworth is so good. Anybody else? Okay, thank you for your report and look forward to your uh, visit next time with hopefully some more promising all comes from, from the borough. Could we have a copy of the presentation? Of course. Yes, of course. Okay, I'm really happy with that. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Item number 10, the lottery. There's a brief note in front of me. I'm eating bedrock for water in. Yes, Chair, um, there has been a, an update to that briefing which has been circulated. There is a, a, a slight error in one that's in the agenda papers, 
insofar as on the second page, there is the table at the top of the page with the uh, prize and the odds. Uh, the prize, the, the six numbers, is actually 25,000 pounds, not 20,000 pounds, as shown there. I understand, Chair, that was requested at the last meeting, mm -hmm. so that's the member's information. No questions for information from Martin? Council Uh I'm particularly um, interested in this MBBC good cause category because I understand that you know, if you're a charity um, and the, uh, I actually went to the link because the officers sent a link or somewhere has a link to an example of it working somewhere else. So charities in the area can actually get people to buy one of these tickets with and choose their charity as the one that's the specified good cause. So if you were the cat's home in Liversley Park or whatever, if there was one, it, you could choose to, the cat's home was where your 50% went. Yeah. But the 8%, I'm not sure whether that is other charities or things that the Borough Council does at the moment that it thinks are good causes. You know, is this replacing um, things that we support like community centres or or is it actually more good causes that are separate from us? Well, all I can say, Chair, is as it says in the uh, briefing note, they're allocated to a good cause of the Council's choice. So it could be anything mm. that the Council decides is what merits um, funding. And I, I, I don't know whether there will be a process that underpins that. I would expect there would be. I think there would be criteria and possibly it'd be done on a like grant application basis that uh, those groups all would apply to the council and we'll use the money on that basis. But I don't want to get that. Could we, could, could we find out of that, uh, that is a case and we can, yeah, for the next meeting, if that's a case, we, mm -hmm. at least we'll be more informed. Okay. Oh. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it says in the table about how the price is split up, that 18% goes to the external lottery manager uh, in order for the council to fund the external lottery manager. How many tickets do we actually need to sell for us to break even for uh, actually hiring or buying in the services of this external lottery manager? It only provides a breakdown on page three of the returns to the causes over the course of the year, didn't actually say at what point and how many tickets we break even. I don't think we employ the manager, do we? But there's still going to be a cost to the council for doing the mm. Well, that, that, the that, that the is market. the cost. Yeah, but if we're paying... There's no cost to the council in that figure, is it? This is, this is an investment the in the lottery and how the money is dispersed as a result of the lottery that we've got to actually purchase the services of the external lottery manager, they aren't going to do it on a pro rata basis. They're they are, doing it on, they? Yeah. Yeah. So you're That's my understanding, anyway. So in theory, if they only sell one ticket, <laughs> the provider <laughs> picks up 18p, could be sell 100,000 tickets, then you obviously get the lottery provider makes a lot more money. There's going to be an outlay to the council to, to do this. And okay. none, none of the briefing note actually explains that. Yeah. There was an outlay in the cabinet thing to set it up, wasn't there? About 15, 20,000? There was an initial uh, cost to set up, but once it's set up, then it's self financing going forward. So but there's officers time. Um, How many tickets do we sell? I have no idea. Let's find out what was going on. Yeah. 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 Um, a couple of things. First one, this might be me being. A bit stupid. I just want a little bit of clarity on how you actually win. Because um, it says that you have to match both the numbers and the sequence as drawn. So it's not like the normal lottery where you just have to get the numbers right. Because that sounds impossibly hard. That, that was my, I just checking that I got that right. And, and secondly, um, I just wanted to pick up on the list of good causes as well. Um, is there going to be um, a limit or a maximum as to how big that list of good causes could be? I just worry that if that list grows too big, then it's going to really water down yeah. the amount that they could receive. Um, 
And also, where it says that groups can apply to be added, my only concern is how easy it would actually be for that application. In my experience of like having to apply for like any type of funding, the levels of bureaucracy and like the amount of evidence that you need to provide and whatnot make it really, really quite challenging to the point where it almost becomes quite off-putting. So are we going to make that as simple and straightforward as we possibly can for those good causes that might want to apply to be on that list? That's my question. Yeah, Rachel, I read the, the couple of the book, but the answer to the, the, the second question is yes, and the answer to the first question is I don't know. Um, the, my understanding is that it's um, any any group or society can can apply to um, be a beneficiary and, and to encourage its members to buy the tickets. And that in effect, my understanding is that the intention behind this is it will replace what a lot of the societies do. They have little money fundraising ex um, exercises they do. They have blackout boards and things like that that people do. And that the intention is that this would be an alternative to that, and that they would encourage their members to do that. And to that extent, the my understanding is there isn't a limit to that because the more members that um, put yeah. money in, yeah. um, the more the greater the chance of there being a, a, a win for them, and yeah. also the more money that the organisation gets. Oh, well, back. you might not get many people playing when they realise how hard it is to win that you've got yeah. to match six numbers and get them in exactly the right order. Mm -hmm. That might need clarifying. Well, uh, as it says, the overall odds of winning a prize is only one in fifty, which is actually not that bad. Think, a, 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 think about a blackout board of uh, a hundred; it, it's one in a hundred. So actually, it, it if I can correct you, the, it's a one in fifty-six <laughs> chance of winning more tickets. So to actually win a prize is one in five hundred. Financial prize. But the overall chance of winning a prize is <laughs> 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 I like the rules. I like the rules. I Sorry, go on. Also, it says that groups can apply to be added to the list of causes. I think we also need clarification over who permits that charity to go onto the list of good causes, and also what is the route of appeal. Because I'm not saying this would happen, but someone could say apply from Whitestone for a charity, because I know there's uh, at Whitestone Community Centre, for example, they do a lot with the elderly community, but a more ungenerous person who makes that decision might say, Whitestone on figures is affluent enough, so you're not entitled mm. to get anything. Mm. But that's not fair on the, on the yeah. residents. Yeah. So, I can't imagine that. Well, we, we've been told that there's plenty of money in Whitestone um, and the other areas of the uh, Well, I could county. tell you that, but... <laughs> <laughs> but you're right in your principle. Yeah, the yeah. principle is that everyone yeah. in the borough, regardless of where they come yeah. from, should be able to apply. Absolutely. Yes. So oh, okay. who makes that decision? Is it, is it, it, or is it an officer? And then yeah. what is the right of appeal? Yeah. Uh, again, Chair, I don't know the specific answer to that because I suspect it will be a, it's, it's, it's a policy decision in effect. My understanding is that for this to work, it has to be available to everybody. Yeah. yeah. To be viable. And yeah. to um, have the but but that's not what this briefing now says. It says you can apply. It doesn't say you'll be automatically granted access to. Well, I don't know. That's, well, I think it's implied, mm -hmm. or it's, it's, it's implicitly understood that that's the case. But uh, mm -hmm. if you want that clarifying and confirming, more than happy to do that. It, so, yeah, it yeah, sounds, frankly, like a no-brainer that if you if you don't limit who can make a contribution, and that places no limit on what the prize could be then I just don't see the, why you would turn anyone down for whatever cause, really. Should, yeah, but then again, it goes, it goes to the point where, where there's only so much money and it could be, it's a telling a you end up with pennies because there's so many people on the left. Perhaps, perhaps there's a... Well, it won't work like that, Chair. That's yeah. the whole point. Yeah. Um, the cause, you can nominate the organisation yeah. that mm. receives the... Uh, the money, so when you're buying your tickets of your pound, you're contributing uh, a certain percentage mm -hmm. to your society or group, so the money will go yeah, to, that, to that, to that mm -hmm. group. So um, it actually encourages groups to increase. To participate. participate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it helps, the Vail Lottery, which is the one mentioned here, is actually online. You can actually see how it works in all the groups that they support. Yeah. Um, and obviously Aylesbury area 
is phenomenally richer than the Neaton. So um, they're, they're supporting probably about 40 different groups. So obviously, <coughs> 120,000 is split between a very large number of groups. And obviously, some groups are more popular than others. But I say, it is a live lottery, so you can actually, members can actually go on and buy a and ticket. And, and buy a ticket for their lottery. <laughs> um, yeah, they're not precious about that either, are they? <laughs> but the, the, the chance of winning their lottery is obviously the same as ours. But mm. we've only, if you only took £40,000, then you'd only get the top prize once every decade or something. Mm. So, so we'll get the answers to the questions as we move. Another point which has just occurred to me about, about prizes, because the breakdown is 20% of, of whatever goes to the prizes. If it's so impossibly difficult to get both the numbers and in the right order, but the prize is capped at £25,000, what happens to the excess money? Because the odds of you getting the numbers in the right order, are, are we going to be sitting on a bank of money as a council? And if so, what are we going to do with that money? We distribute it according to what it says in no, no, but 20% is ring fence for the prizes. Now, if you don't get the numbers to pay out the prizes, that money has got to sit somewhere. Yeah, but the prizes then build up. No, it's capped right. at 25,000. No. Yeah. Yeah. 25, There's no rollovers. But you could still get more than one winner. You might get multiple winners, yeah. Yeah. But, but, that's, the but on the odds, that's it, unlikely. Uh, my understanding of how it works is actually the company running it has all the cash. It takes all the risk, and it may have to pay out £25,000 on the first week it runs our lottery, but it's winning lots of these lotteries, and over the course of a year, it will pay out, if it's got 10 of these lotteries on the go, 25000 only to one of them. So it's like a bookies. They are bookies. Yeah, they're, they're taking their 18 That's to 20%. That's about the bookies margin, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, this actually takes a lot of money from the borough. We have no risk, but it actually is a negative thing in terms of good causes and actually we lose the 20 or 18 percent margin and the vat to the borough so the blackout board on the scout hot keeps some money in the borough mm. well, we'll try and get some answers for the next meeting yeah? yes yes yeah, all right lots of calls. Four and five. Uh, that's uh, back there, Chair, for um, your information. And if there's anything that when it comes to the work program, which is next item, thinking on there, which is of interest to the panel, we can add it to the full plan. And then we'll get along in 12 together. Quick question Is the community infrastructure economic or is it planning and development? coming to September's cabinet. Good question, no? <laughs> I don't know, Chair. I'd have to, have to check and see. Um, my my instinctive feeling is it's probably planning and development yeah. because it is linked to... Um, oh, DC. It, it is linked to the... Economic incorporate. It's got economic corporate on the yeah. I'll need to I'll need to check that. I think I think we may have that may may not be right. I'll, I I can understand because uh, Simone's leading on it that she may have thought it comes here, but I've got a feeling that because it's effectively a replacement for uh, planning obligations and is very much linked to development and development control. Um, I, I, I I do question that. So. Um, I'll need to come back to you on that. Okay. Come on, on that point, I think the community infrastructure levy should be seen, should be go to one of the scrutinies. So, um, if it doesn't go to the other one, it should go to this one okay. on the work program. Well, it would. It would. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Anything else? Right. Then item number eleven. Thank you very much. I would know. On the right, thank you very much for attending and safe journey home. Mm. Now I've got a route mic to get my blue from town. Yeah, there's no need. Why, my car's out here. Yeah. Well, I was over the fingers at the car park, we touched on the